taking place in Germany. The ship is the QE2. It's an £80 million contract, and although British GEC is supplying the ship's electric motors, no British shipyard is involved. Charles Wheeler has been finding out why. The regimental band of the 15th, 19th King's Royal Hussars playing to the QE2 as she prepares to cast off from Southampton en route for New York at 7 o'clock last Sunday evening. She's due in New York at 8 o'clock on Friday morning, and her captain and chief engineer will be sailing with their fingers crossed. For since the spring, the QE2 has occasionally been plagued by boiler trouble. It happened in May, on the 50th anniversary of the old Queen Mary's maiden transatlantic voyage, when the QE2 had to miss New York and dock instead in Baltimore. And it happened again last week, when she was forced by boiler trouble to reduce her speed from 28 knots to 26 and docked in Southampton late. However, by missing out a scheduled call at Sherberg, she hopes to make New York on time. The fact is that this handsome but aging vessel is being worked at the limit of her strength. She spends no fewer than 240 days at sea, cruising throughout the winter and shuttling back and forth across the Atlantic in summer with less than a day between voyages in port. She's getting too old to stand the pace. Her troubles aren't exactly terminal, merely the equivalent of hardening arteries and stiffness in the joints, but to prolong her life by another 20 years, her owners are giving the queen a transplant, taking her out of commission for six winter months while she's given new engines. At the moment, Queen Elizabeth II is steam powered by three boilers onto main turbines. And what we're going to do in October is to take those engines and boilers out and fit nine diesel generators which will then power two large propulsion motors. And from this we uh, would expect to get extra savings on fuel and inherent reliability by this new plant and extend the life of the ship. The QE2 was launched in the John Brown shipyard on the River Clyde in 1967. Those were the days of the slogan, Britain can make it. Completing her took another 19 months. She was to have had four boilers. To save money, Cunard settled for three, a decision the owners must now regret. For 17 years, she's been the most glamorous ship in the world and has earned her owners hundreds of millions of dollars. Most of her passengers are American tourists, even this week. <laughs> to replace her now would cost Cunard anything from 200 to 400 million pounds. Not that any British shipyard could build a passenger liner today. As for the rejuvenation she is to undergo this winter, the work will be done in West Germany, since Britain cannot make it any longer. By any standard, re-engineering a ship like the QE2 is a daunting project, but it's a valuable order and a prestigious one too. When Cunard invited tenders, they came in from France and Scandinavia, from Japan, from Korea, and from three West German yards. Not one British yard put in a bid. But can we really afford to lose an order like that, let it go abroad? Could the government perhaps have done something? We asked the Department of Trade and Industry. Good heavens, no, they said. It's nothing to do with us. This is a purely commercial order. So what about British shipbuilding, the nationalized half of the industry that has been laying off hundreds of workers all across the country? Could they not have marshaled their resources and put in a bid? For example, there is a yard in Southampton that belonged to British shipbuilders until it was privatized last September. The Fosper Ship Repairing Yard has one of the biggest dry docks in Britain. The old Queen Mary used to use it, so did the first Queen Elizabeth, so did the QE2 for her annual refits in 1980, 81 and 82. It's true the yard lacks big cranes, but they could be hired. Experts we've talked to here insist that with enough organization, Phosphorus could have re-engined the QE2. But the decision to bid or not to bid was not made here, but in Newcastle at the headquarters of British shipbuilders. As for the workforce, its leaders were not consulted. 
We are standing right on the in the area that has outfitted and carried out all sorts of major work on the largest liners that the world has ever seen. And there is no doubt in my mind that given the motivation and given the support that that job could have been done in the United Kingdom. Do you think it's a major fillip to a West German company to have got this major contract now? Of course it does. For any other European country other than Great Britain to secure a major refurbishing contract for Cunard is a national disgrace. For many years, it's been the fashion to put most of the blame for the decline of the British shipbuilding industry on the unions and their members, demarcation disputes and so on. But Phosphorus is also the yard that fitted out the QE2 for her long trip south to the Falklands War in the spring of 1982. The local managers and dockyard workers did the job in record time and restored her for passenger service in the summer. So could not Cunard, remembering these prompt deliveries of their liner, have contrived to keep the work in Britain? Well, put quite simply, um, it went to uh, a German yard because the British yards didn't want to tender for it. Uh, we invited tenders from various uh, people and for various reasons which are obviously uh, their concern, they elected uh, not to enter into further detailed discussions with us. It was sad for us that no British Yard felt able to even offer um, uh, to come and talk to us about it. Didn't they talk to you about it at all? Not uh, in any detail, no. Up in the north, on Tyneside, a landscape of cranes, immobile as statues, testifies to the industry's accelerating decline. We came here to ask British shipbuilders why they'd failed to tender for a job that would have kept hundreds of men now facing layoffs in work for at least six months. We couldn't, in our view, achieve the time scale. It's seven months was a very tight time scale, and if you don't have the facilities for doing the job, then you can't really bid for it. It's well, as the as simple as Southampton, that. which fits the ship, with quite a lot of measurement to spare at either end. Yes, but it doesn't have the craneage because there, there are eight new engines to go into the ship. And in fact, you, there, there are many hundreds of tons. You have to lift them in as one unit. You can't strip them down if you're going to meet the time limit. And therefore, you've got to have good craneage. And that dock doesn't happen to have the kind of craneage that's needed. I can assure you, we looked at every possible way of doing it. And that was at the time, of course, that we did have the ship repair facility in use at Southampton. So we, we did have that facility, that backup, people who could look at it properly for us. We've been down to Southampton, we've looked at the dock, we've yes. looked at the craneage, and we have been told by people that it would be possible to provide the craneage there, either by hiring or bringing in a floating crane. There is one, in fact, at this moment, a 200-ton floating tra crane just down the quayside. Yes, well, you couldn't float the, the crane into the dock. I mean, you have to actually no, do time. the... No, but I mean, the ship has to be in the dock to have some of this work done, so that doesn't make sense. Whoever advised you doesn't understand what they're talking about. Well, who are we to argue with an expert? But surely there is more than one way to refit a ship. What seems to have deterred potential British builders for the contract is the prospect of having to cut an enormous hole in the side of the QE2. While she's in a dry dock that might well be long enough to take the ship with ease, but could be uncomfortably narrow given the size of the boilers that have to come out and the generators and the engines that have to go in through the same hole. But as we shall show, there is another method. British shipbuilders apparently didn't think of it. And neither did Cunard until the German ship repairer who got the contract signed it and then told the owners how he was going to do the job. Over the months, Cunard reduced the competition to a choice between two yards in Germany. One is in Hamburg. The world-famous Blom and Foss, builders of the battleship Bismarck and of 242 U-boats during the war and of many other vessels since. It was Blom and Foss that converted the liner France into the cruise ship Norway, and the yard is superbly equipped. It has a 600-ton crane and its floating dock, number 11, is the largest in Europe and easily wide enough to take the QE2 and re-engine the ship by cutting a hole in her side. That's how they were going to do it. Blumenfoss didn't get the contract. It went instead to Bremerhaven on the river Weser. Ein Glück aus Bremerhaven ist allen Mädchen frei. Ja, 
Er hat nur eine feste Frau und 20 nebenbei. The successful bidder for the biggest and most complex ship conversion job ever was a small and rather modest looking yard called Lloyd Werft. What Lloyd Werft has got is a proven record. The QE2 has been here twice before. That and a managing director with ideas. The ship is coming in, she goes into that dock, we will pump, dry, pump the dock dry and then we are taking away the funnel then we're removing all the exhaust from the main boilers, air trunking from the main in order to have a clearly space where we can take out the old equipment like the main, the main turbines, auxiliary turbine and the main boiler. Everything goes out and we are not going from the side but we're going from the removed funnel with a floating crane which will be positioned over there behind the shed. We have found a big crane and the crane is now working in the North Sea and he has it reached so that we can take out uh, pieces up to a weight of 80, 90 tons each. And then what happens? Then we take the ship flo flo uh, flooded up again and then we take the ship over to the pier in a floating uh, condition. What, over here? Yeah, over there, here. Then the ship goes over to here. The hardest work will now be done with the QE2 tied up along the quayside. Had German diesel engines and British driving motors made by GEC and weighing 450 tons apiece will be lifted from pontoons and lowered through the top of the ship by the floating crane now alongside the liner. I think at the moment everything is so far cleared up that the erection time in Bremerhaven is following the schedule. Yeah. The job will involve above all meticulous planning. Everything must be ready on the quayside when the workers need it. But it will be done with available gear. Herr Knut's dry dock is smaller than several in Britain, including the one in Southampton, and he's hiring the heavy crane, as British shipbuilders might have done. But will he be able to keep his promise to finish the job in 179 days? British shipbuilders shied away from the risk. For when the work is done, the QE2 is going cruising without a single day's delay. If she's held up, the shipyard will have to pay. Now, you're going to do this in 179 days? Exactly, yes. Are you sure? Yes, if, if I would not be sure, I would not have signed the contract. Now, what happens if you're late? What happens if you have problems? Uh, we had to accept a lot of penalties for late delivery and also for other technical failures, uh, but I'm confident that we will re-deliver after 179 days. You're a gambler. No, I'm not. I'm confident because we have done big jobs here already in the past and we know what we are talking about. In North Germany, as in Britain, Shipbuilding workers have held strikes and sit-ins in an effort to persuade government to step in and keep the industry going. They have failed. Two celebrated shipyards, Deutsche Werft and AG Weser, have closed down altogether, throwing thousands of skilled men out of work. So, for Lloyd Werft, the QE2 re-engineering contract is a boom. It will occupy 800 men for half a year, and it will attract attention of owners of passenger ships all across the world, for there is still a market for major ship repairing and conversion. Sadly, British shipbuilders and the British government have largely ignored it, and some independent British experts think that was a major mistake. For example, the chairman of the Conservative Party Shipbuilding Committee at Westminster. British shipbuilders are an example of an organization being too large, too rambling, and a lack of clear identity between the center and the people down in the yards who are actually doing the job. Now, is there a role for government in this? Because government took a very passive view, too, clearly. Yes, well, this is uh, very much a personal view of mine. I believe in the modern world, government has got uh, a catalytic role, even where it is not directly intervening. And, of course, in the case of shipbuilding, ship repairing, there are funds. I mean, the idea there is a totally free market in this uh, is I share an illusion, as I keep on repeating in the House of Commons. Look at what the French do, look at what the Germans do. Above all, look what the Japanese do. I think it shows an inability in this country uh, to cope with a major 
refit job, which we ought to be capable of doing. And in the proper sense of the word, it is something of which we ought to be ashamed. Do you think British shipbuilders was capable of doing it? I believe the skills were there, but I think they lacked the will to put an act together. So is it a question of management? Ultimately, yes. Everything at the end gets back to management. I, I'm of the old generation. There's no such thing as bad men, there are only bad officers. <laughs>